esoteric philosophy with a bit of stuff drawn from my manifesto, which everybody should write a manifesto, I think, at some point in their life. At least one. Um, <clears throat> we can argue about that later. Um, so, I first realized the rich sound capabilities of latex balloons when I used them as preparations on my guitar in the late 1980s. In 1990, in an effort to work with a music vocabulary free from the usual parameters, I created my first work orchestrated exclusively for balloons. Intrigued with the sounds I discovered, I created more pieces and improvisations for balloons, and by 1992, I was able to present a full evening of works for balloons at the Alternative Museum in New York. From the beginning, I tried to limit myself to the latex balloon, these are latex balloons, not mylar, not anything else, to the latex balloon and the body. It was essential to be able to physically feel the vibrations, the air pressure, and the texture of the balloons. By using the mouth, hands, and body, I could more effectively navigate the malleable sounds. There were also social and conceptual reasons for my choice to be more physical and to work only with latex. This non-judgmental oral, that's A-U-R-A-L, relationship and its corporeal visual manifestation also served as a rebellion against power structures that have oppressed women and ultimately all humankind by severing the connection between the psyche and the body. Throughout the past millennium, power structures in Western culture have used dissociation of music and the human body as an effective tool to control and manipulate the masses. In medieval times, church officials in Rome sought to ban music from the church for fear it was too sensual. The nun and also composer Hildegard von Bingen altered the course of history when she, conce when she convinced the medieval church officials that all sacred music, both instrumental and vocal, functioned as a bridge between God and humanity. However, as the millennium progressed, sensuality became even more deeply associated with sin, and sensuality grew to be considered a product of the feminine, whether the feminine, the feminine, embodied itself as a woman, a transgender, as with Joan of Arc, or a homosexual. The church believed the seductiveness of femininity must be repressed in order to protect men, including priests, from sin. Thus, sensuality in music was equally restrained and punished lest it, it, appear, lest it appear too seductively feminine. European explorers used this repression of the body to justify genocide and slavery. Music and dance were a unified art in other cultures, and within this art, sex was glorified. 
The European invaders claimed this as evidence of their superiority to other races because for them, dissociation between art and the body was tantamount to supreme spirituality and intellect. In the 20th century, with the rise of feminism, civil rights, gay gender rights, and recognition of the intellectual equality of other cultures, this separation began, this separation between art and the body began to disintegrate. The natural inclination of human beings to experience art holistically, combined with the capabilities of new technology, began to force the dominant power structures into a new acceptance. Film reunited sound in the moving image, television transported it into a personal setting. In the 1960s, influenced by the philosophies of John Cage and inspired by the new opportunities for individual self-expression, avant-garde sound artists of all races, genders, sexualities, and social strata celebrated the end of high art. The toy balloon frequently appears as both a statement against elitism and an exploration of formerly forbidden soundscapes in the work of these optimistic pioneers. In 1963, as part of the first annual New York avant-garde festival, Charlotte Mormon, the cellist, included a balloon pop in her interpretation of Cage's 26 minutes, one second, point one four nine nine for string player. Numerous artists involved with the so-called Fluxus movement, including George Machunas, Ben Patterson, A.O., Klaus Oldenburg and Robert Watts used balloons as sound producers in their multimedia happenings. Maurizio Cagle included seven pages of balloon instructions in his seminal composition, Acoustica, in 1968. However, jazz composer Anthony Braxton, his composition 25, in which he wrote in 1972, utilizes 250 balloons divided among, amongst 15 musicians. And this work best demonstrates the full symbolic meaning of the balloon in the early avant-garde. In composition 25, balloon sounds replicated those of expensive electronic equipment that was not affordable to most African-American composers at that time. Thus, the balloon, like jazz itself, functions as a parody of white culture and a protest against classism. Furthermore, Braxton used balloons as improvisational tools rather than controlled instruments. Bebop and the collective improvisation music at Spawn showed that the African tradition of improvisation is showed the African tradition of improvisation as rivaling the intellect of the European model. Braxton used balloons as a tool of ch a tool to change the way that improvisers thought about sound, to free them from inhibitions, and to open their minds to limitless possibilities. My own work then does not come out of a void. Creating a large body of work for balloons has allowed me to develop a vocabulary outside the realm of oppressive classical heritage. It has raised the ordinary mundane to the status of high art. I have fetishized this simple cheap toy in my music as the violin has been fetishized for centuries by Western European influenced composers. In an era where the progress toward a woman's, body, a woman's control of her own body is threatened, I have coupled myself to a musical instrument that expresses sensuality, sexuality, and humanity without inhibition. In my over 40 compositions for balloons, as well as my improvisations, the latex balloon is used directly as a sound producer. I primarily use the balloons in three sound capacities, reeds, orb-shaped strings, orb-shaped strings, and resonators. Science can't explain some of the strange acoustic phenomena produced by latex and by latex balloons. The balloon is capable of a wide variety of timbres and techniques that no other instrument can produce. The balloon is entirely flexible because the latex molecule can spread out and spring back to its original shape. The pitches produced are infinitesimally microtonal, as you will hear tonight. The natural harmonic series is distorted due to the spherical shape and the flexibility, the flexibility of the substance. The balloon functions as its own resonator, amplifying its own inherent frequencies. Small balloons, the kind commonly sold in department stores, are the best for use as reeds. So I'm going to talk about the three sound capacities. That's kind of how I, how I work. I work from these three sound capacities as opposed to little balloons, big balloons, and middle you know, balloons or whatever. So um, for instance, these balloons, which you know you bought in the store, in the, in the whatever, the department store. 
um, or wherever they sell little birthday balloons now. Um, these are best for use as reeds. So after, I'm not going to demonstrate now because I'm going to play a piece later and you'll see it. Um, after inflating the balloon, I pinch either side of the mouth of the balloon with the thumb and index fingers of each hand. And as the air leaves the balloon, it vibrates the opening in a manner similar to the way breath vibrates a double reed. Thus my description of the balloon as a reed. The range of the small balloon, this balloon, is quite high. It starts about an octave above middle C and goes up for about two octaves at least. Um, this range can vary according to the size of the mouth of the balloon. The actual size of the balloon is not necessarily a factor in the range. The important thing is the size of the opening. Um, though the typical range is about two octaves, a skilled player can access notes, as I said, 11 below that range. Most people hold the small balloon in their lap to play it in order to mash the air out of the balloon as it deflates. However, I find that a more interesting tone can be achieved by continuing to hold the mouth of the balloon just past the, past the entrance to my mouth um, and using my mouth as a resonant chamber. In other words, you'll see tonight I, I hold it here when I, when I, after I blow it up, I don't move it away. And that's because I'm actually using my skull to, as a resonator for the balloon sound. Um, and this also gives me the opportunity to use my tongue and mouth to articulate the notes and to add tone color. Um, now, uh, let's see, that's there. Yeah. So the other way I use the balloon is as an orb-shaped, sorry, <laughs> as an orb-shaped um, string. So imagine a string, okay, a, a violin string, okay, held taut, right, very tight. And imagine the string magically just melts and spins out into an orb, and that taut string that's, that's spun out into an orb, like a globe, is held taut by a column of air. The air is inside. So I have a string that's just like a big ball. Um, and, well, you see. I mean, this, this balloon I don't use in that way, but I'll use a, a middle-sized balloon that's about this big. It's hidden inside this garbage bag. So tonight, with the orb-shaped string, So it, it, has, it also has an overtone series like a string. Um, I mean, you're, okay, you're familiar with the overtone series on a string, you know, half, you know, quarters, whatever. You get different pitches. Or if you're a guitar player, you, if you want to tune your guitar, you, you know, you clink it, clink it at halfway to get the to tuning. So this is, this is what I'm saying. It has an overtone series just like a string. The balloon does, but the fact that it's curved, the fact that it's it's very malleable, means that that overtone series becomes very irregular. As it pops up the overtone series, it's just shaking like this. So every in a microsecond, every note that it hits, which it hits quite a few, um, it bends. So then you get this beautiful, you know, um, series of notes that sound like something from Schoenberg. <laughs> instead of the overtone series, um, or Bartok or something. I don't know. Probably more like Schoenberg. Um, I have a theory about Schoenberg, too. <laughs> I can discuss another day. Um, so that he was actually using balloons. No, not really. <laughs> um, so, um, So, so I mean, you can you can tell from time stretching, electronic time stretching, recording small samples. You can you can hear how this overtone series lays out. Um, for the rubbing technique, I used a large 16-inch round professional decorator balloon. These balloons are thicker and more resilient and less likely to pop. The way I make the balloon sound is I just rub my hands over the surface, and you'll see tonight I use hot water as the lubricant on the balloon because I want something to give me a little bit of friction. You know, I don't want it, I don't want too, I don't want my hands to slide too easily. So you want a little bit of friction, but not too much. Um, and latex is also very sensitive to heat, so that's why I use hot water as opposed to cold water. Um, and also I hold the balloon between my knees, and this again gives me more physical contact and more uh, ability to kind of vary the, the microtones that I play. But I don't control the balloon like you control an instrument. I'm more 
I'm familiar with the balloon and I'm more exploring what it's going to give me tonight as opposed to knowing what I'm going to do, what I'm going to play. Um, and the overtone series, the tuning, the timbre, vary according to where you're playing on the surface as well, because you might get a different overtone series or a different fundamental and a different point on the balloon. So. And lastly, uh, I use balloons as resonators. Of course, the tenor balloon, which I'll show you later, um, the one that I rub with the wet hands, it functions as its own resonator. But this balloon I use exclusively as a resonator, this giant, what I call the giant balloon. It used to be bigger, but the organizers kept complaining, so <laughs> I made it smaller. And then they complained that it was too small. But, um, <laughs> but anyway, this is the large balloon, and I use it as a resonator. And you'll see tonight how I make the surface resonate. And I, the, the sound does not come from inside the balloon, as many people mistakenly think. It, it literally comes from the surface, just like, um, well, like a classical guitar, I guess. Um, so that the surface vibrates, and then it, it generates a very, very low sub-audio tone, which is quite nice. Um, So the first pieces I will be performing, oh, well, not, I think we changed the order, but I'm going to be performing two pieces tonight with the violinist Tom Chu. And these pieces use the balloon as a reed and as an orb-shaped string. And Tom and I, Tom's wandering over here somewhere, Tom and I have worked together for over 10 years. In that time, we've explored and developed a liaison between the sound of the balloon and the sound of the violin. And no violinist on earth hears and understands and interprets the sound of the balloon as well as Tom Chu. Um, and these studies are both orally and orally developed and remembered. They are the result of a continuing collaboration. I also wrote a piece. I wrote a piece, a 30-minute piece for his string quartet, the Flux Quartet, um, a piece called Four Balloon and String Quartet. So. Um, Can I add something to that piece? What? Can I say add something yeah, about that piece? Yeah. What about well, what's amazing is that piece is fully written in traditional notation. And who can say it's because of our more than 10 years of working together. I mean, I learned from you, but you also learned from me. I mean, right? I mean, I helped you a little bit, right? Maybe a little. Maybe a little bit, right? <laughs> but, but, but she was able to notate what's really something very abstract. So, and, and the quartet is actually playing notated music that sounds like an orchestra of balloons. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think too, I've, I've talked a lot about the physics of the balloon. I studied, Tom doesn't really know this, I studied a bit about the physics of string instruments as well. And this helped me with thinking about how to, to meld these sounds and how they were similar. Mm -hmm. you know? um, so the final piece, this is a bit of a change back into the earlier topic. The final piece that I'm going to perform this evening I call Swirl Oton, long story. But in this piece, I use the balloon as a giant resonator, as I just described. Um, the piece for <clears throat> giant balloon and voices goes to the heart of the conceptual foundation of my work. In the late 1980s and early 90s, I was living in New York City, and people were dying around me in the hundreds from AIDS. And in those days, some people, including my friends, died within weeks of being diagnosed. Um, I think people now just can't imagine how horrible this was, because you know now you have all the cocktails and everything that people take. but. Um, but it was, it was unbelievable, and of course, in other parts of the world, this is still happening where they don't have the drugs for, for AIDS and HIV. Um, then there was this, of course, this remarkable discovery that uh, a condom could keep you from contracting HIV, because I, mean, I remember the days when we didn't know, when people were just getting sick and we didn't know how it was spreading, and, um, and then it turned out a condom was all you needed. Latex, stretched latex. It can save your life. And I think this is when balloons began to speak to me. Really. I had been using them among my arsenal of toys on the guitar. I was a guitarist for a long time, not anymore. But I had used them to get sounds with the guitar. But 
I think that was that was when when that became um, they began to take on a life of their own as sound producers for me. Um, it was AIDS that brought this focus, this artistic and sonic obsession with latex to the fore. In the late 1990s, then to get on to the piece I'm talking about to, for tonight, in the late 1990s under the Bush administration, I mean the, the Bush Jr. You know, that we have now, um, in the United States Agency for International Development, which is called USAID, instituted the Anti-Prostitution Pledge which required all countries receiving AIDS and HIV funding to denounce sex workers and sex worker rights. Many sex workers who had been getting free or cheap condoms through local organizations funded by USAID could no longer get condoms. Combined with the Bush administration's ridiculous abstinence policies, this has resulted in the spread of HIV and the death of thousands, if not millions, of people in less developed countries. So this piece that I'll do tonight, I play the balloon, but it also combines a soundtrack that I've created of voices of sex workers and also people who do not work as sex workers to show sex workers as everyday human beings who deserve respect and human rights. And it also features the voices of sex worker rights advocates from various international organizations speaking at the 2006 conference on HIV AIDS in Toronto, Canada about the anti-prostitution pledge. And in an ironic turn of events, Randall Tobias, the director of USAID and one of the strongest proponents of the anti-prostitution pledge, was forced to resign about, oh, maybe less than a year ago when it was discovered that he was a regular client of a Washington, D.C. prostitute <laughs> who, who um, unethically, but I think ethically, uh, turned his name into the media. Um, so anyway. Um, Yeah, I think I think that is pretty much the the end of my um, my presentation. World Sex Workers Internet Radio Lounge, which is a webcast and now beginning to be a podcast of audio by sex workers and sex worker activists and sex worker artists and so forth, uh, just a, a forum for for sex worker um, voices on the internet, but no no visual. It's not a video. Thing, or it's not a blog, it's, it's just voices. And I, I like this very much this uh, human aspect of things. Um, so that's all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have questions? Does anyone have questions? The, your choice of the blue is both kind of a sonic attraction and also, like you said, in the, in the AIDS, with the AIDS, it kind of, uh, the, the connotation that the latex has and the kind of social issues that it relates to is also your attraction of choosing this instrument. Can you talk a little bit more about how in music, um, or maybe when you, when you teach your students the importance of um, choosing instruments both in relationship to its sonic qualities and to social issues. I mean, those things are never really obvious, um, even though there is a connection. Mm -hmm. um, but. Well, I guess, I guess you have to think about it <laughs> to get to it. Um, I, I, I lost your question. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, I guess that wasn't a great question. Um, it was more of a comment. Yeah. <laughs> how might social beliefs tie into your choice of instruments? Well, I think. And how you I might convey that to you? Exactly. <laughs> I think I covered that, but um, but I that that it's it's a very it's a very sensual uh, physical thing dealing with air and latex. It's very malleable. It's very physical. Um, I mean, I, you know, I don't want to play a condom. I yeah. mean, it doesn't. It, it. I mean, I could, but it actually doesn't give a good sound. <laughs> so they break really easy when you inflate them with, you know, air as opposed to what they should be inflated with. You know. So. Good question. You've, you've had the opportunity to 
uh, for a, a good part of your career to, to talk to and, and, and deal with uh, a marginalized uh, part of society. And have you had the, the chance to bring your music to them or share your music with them somehow and uh, get feedback on it? Well, I, okay, I've worked with Annie Sprinkle, and Annie's always been really supportive. In fact, th I think this whole thing began, I don't know if any of you are familiar with Annie Sprinkle, the performance artist. She's legendary. Look her up on the internet, Annie Sprinkle. Um, so I, I started working with, I started talking to Annie, oh gosh, like 2000, and then we did uh, a little performance together at Museum of Sex, in 2002, maybe, or 2003. And we, we, we've done a couple of other things together, and I've written some music for her. So I think it initially started with working with Annie. And Annie loves my balloons because she loves avant-garde work. So that, you know, that connection is fine. But as far as how many sex workers listen to avant-garde music, I mean, that's how many people on earth listen to avant-garde music. Maybe not as many as listen to rock bands. <laughs> you know, and that's okay with me. And in fact, I found the I found it to be more of a, a hindrance to uh, to my work with sex workers, my my work in the avant-garde, in a way, because um, it, my work is not about me. It's it's totally different. It's a totally different direction. Um, and I like that, you know. I like working in another capacity for a change. I was talking to Xavier Hollander today for, the pro for this project, and she said, I, I remake myself every 10 years or something like that. And I was like, yeah, that's a good idea. <laughs> Time to remake myself. Yeah, but she's always, you know, she's always going to be remembered for the happy hooker, and I guess I'll always be remembered for balloons if I'm lucky. So, <laughs> you know. Does that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. So, shall we take a little break and then we can come back and you can actually hear us play balloons? I mean, have, hear me play balloons and Tom play violin? Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.